So good afternoon, everybody. We know that the last panel is always um, a difficult one because uh, we're tired. We've been having uh, two full days full of information, knowledge, uh, discussions, questions, answers, and then all the discussions that we have in the coffee breaks during the lunch. So I know everybody's tired, uh, but thanks for, for holding up and for being here. The people um, on, in, in the room and the people virtually also, uh, thank you so much. And I want to take advantage also to thank to the translators who have been nonstop working for, for two days, making um, able that we, we actually have the, the, the whole panel, the whole two days in Spanish for the whole region. Uh, so thank you very much. And, and please, if you uh, help me with some applauses for the translators. So we're going to start our last panel, which is going to share some of the different things that we've been doing on health insurance and investment innovation. I know they, they really sound like different things, but um, I think through this panel, we're going to be surprised how interconnected they can be. Uh, and if not, then we'll find out how interconnected they should be. So without any, any, other, um, any other introduction, um, let's please uh, welcome Ti Jun Sheng, which I hope I pronounce it right, um, who uh, is from the Research Institute of Highway from the Ministry of China. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. It's my real pleasure to share some information about the China Ramp and the Highway Safety to Treasure Life program which is a national uh, level uh, highway safety improvement uh, program in China. Uh, China RAP is a uh, uh, so collaboration between uh, IRAP and the uh, uh, Research Institute of Highway MOT uh, China. Uh, for the development of uh, progress of China RAP, we have some case, uh, case stage. The first one is 2007. Uh, our institute and IRAP sent the uh, uh, MOU. So we uh, began the formal development of uh, China RAP. And in 2011, we, uh, we began the first uh, uh, active project. 2013 and 2014, uh, we, uh, we got uh, many opportunity for projects such as uh, international projects in uh, Yemen and in New Zealand, and also many uh, Chinese uh, projects. Uh, at this stage, we began the systemic uh, research and the develop of our model, our equipment, uh, and our software. Uh, 2000, uh, uh, 2015, uh, we got the big opportunity to support the, this China Treasure Life project. And after uh, such projects, we are expanding uh, our program. Uh, for China Life research and development, uh, this includes the uh, model, equipment, and uh, uh, software. The model is the uh, most important uh, for China Rap. Our model includes both uh, international framework and uh, Chinese characteristics. Uh, so they, uh, this program can match the uh, Chinese uh, traffic safety condition. Uh, for equipment, we have uh, laser-based uh, uh, equipment and portable equipment. Uh, for the software, we have uh, service software, uh, coding software, and analysis software like, uh, like, we, like VEDA. Also, we develop uh, some apps uh, to support the survey and the uh, assessment, which make the uh, uh, road assessment uh, more convenient and uh, low cost. During our uh, development and application, we have many cooperation with uh, international organizations uh, such as the World Bank, ADB, 
uh, and also we have very close relation with the Chinese uh, government, such as the uh, uh, central government and the local government. Our, uh, most of our projects are Chinese uh, projects. Uh, with our efforts, uh, currently uh, uh, our projects cover all kinds of roads, such as East Freightways, national and provincial roads, rural roads and urban roads. Uh, we have projects in more than six, uh, more than six countries, uh, such as Yemen, uh, New Zealand, uh, Cambodia, and uh, Tanzania. And in China, we have projects in more than 25 provinces, such as Beijing, Tianjin, Xinjiang, and uh, other uh, provinces. Uh, more than uh, 250,000 kilometer roads were assessed uh, by China Rap. These photos show our works in abroad countries. Uh, such as uh, New Zealand, uh, uh, Cambodia, and uh, other countries. Uh, for the application of uh, China Rap, uh, we nearly cover all the uh, aspects uh, for traffic safety. Uh, there are some typical uh, examples, such as the, uh, such as uh, support the uh, safety in, uh, investment plan making. And uh, uh, second, use for the uh, design target uh, making. And also, uh, as a speed limit uh, uh, is, a, uh, is a big topic in China now, we use uh, China Rap to support the scientific uh, decision for speed, uh, speed management. And also, we use China Rap to support the facility management. Uh, that means in the facility management, we can get the biggest uh, benefit, uh, both safety and, uh, uh, and uh, investment. Also, we use China Rap to support the allocate of uh, materials. Uh, and, uh, we use China Rap to do the monitoring and the dynamic risk management work. Uh, with the rapid uh, uh, economy and the social development of China, our government pay more attention to the road, uh, the traffic safety in all the level, which include uh, the improvement of traffic safety law. And uh, uh, in the whole traffic safety, uh, tra whole traffic sa system such as uh, uh, vehicle safety, emergency, uh, uh, the quality of road users, and the infrastructure, uh, the project I introduced mostly focus on infrastructure improvement. In China, we began the national level highway safety improvement uh, project uh, at 2000, uh, 2004. Uh, this project uh, is, 10 year, is 10 years project, mostly focused on the improvement of uh, national and, prov and provincial uh, highways. In 10 years, uh, uh, totally investment uh, uh, was about uh, uh, 30 uh, billion uh, RMB, which is about uh, 5 billion US dollar. Uh, during this, in this project, about uh, uh, 80,000 kilometer new barriers were uh, built. And, uh, more than uh, 210,000 kilometer roads were improved. Uh, with, after the implementation of this project, we, uh, we got big effect. Uh, for the roads in, uh, improvement, improved, the accident, accident number reduced about uh, 77, 
and the death reduced uh, about uh, 82. Even we got a lot of achievement. Uh, our government uh, still, still uh, find there are many safety challenges, such as the gap between increasing traffic demand and insufficient traffic facilities, and the accident rate is still high compared to other countries, especially the developed countries. And there are still many uh, very serious accidents happened. So the government began to launch the second stage uh, national level project. 2012, uh, uh, our state council issued the, the uh, document to begin the uh, highway safety to travel life project. Compared to the first stage project, this uh, project includes not only provincial and national roads, but also its pathways and rurals. And uh, uh, for the roads, include existing roads uh, and uh, new build, uh, new construction and reconstructed roads. Uh, there are two principles. One is uh, for uh, one is we plan to eliminate all the existing hazards. Uh, another principle is uh, for new construction roads, no more new hazards should be uh, should be produced. And the China Rep was uh, selected to support the decision making for this project. And this uh, uh, pro uh, progress to make the plan, uh, which include a uh, uh, detailed road survey and coding and uh, uh, identify high risk sediment, analyze the uh, high risk reasons, and uh, select the countermeasures, uh, then make the investment plan and uh, do the implementation. Uh, this table shows the information uh, uh, record for investment plan, such as the locations, the high risk, high risk reasons, such as this sharp curve, or roadside hazards, and also the countermeasures planted to uh, use, such as uh, barrier, marking lines, and uh, also the planted, uh, the planted uh, uh, money and the planted year. Uh, so all the invest, investment will be based on such plan. The designer then can do the design based uh, on the uh, investment plan. Uh, we use ChinaRap to, um, uh, to measure if the design, design can match the uh, safety target. If it cannot match, we will uh, improve the, the de design until it can, uh, can achieve the target. And after construction, we'll, uh, we'll reassess again to summary experience to improve future uh, projects. And there are some typical uh, countermeasures. Uh, in this, uh, we show the multiple and appropriate uh, principle countermeasure selections, such as uh, for countermeasure selections, uh, we first think about the proactive uh, countermeasures, such as the delineations, and also for roadside uh, uh, countermeasures, uh, there are some uh, uh, these pictures or some uh, examples. Also, there are uh, some countermeasures uh, for uh, site distance improvement and uh, speed control measures. Okay, I know. Uh, uh, we assess uh, more than uh, uh, twenty, uh, more than two hundred thousand kilometer roads in this uh, project, and uh, for the investment, two thousand seventeen, uh, we invested more uh, more than uh, sixteen billion RMB, and uh, one hundred seventy thousand kilometer roads 
were improved uh, last year. And uh, we got, even this is not finished, we already uh, got a lot of benefit, uh, such as uh, uh, very good response from the society. And uh, for next stage, we will continue uh, to uh, invest, such as for, uh, for this year, uh, more than 180,000 kilometer roads will, uh, will be improved. And by the, 2000, uh, uh, by the 2020, we will finish this. And also, we will track and monitor the effect of this project, then we can improve. And there are also many cooperation with, uh, with other uh, departments, such as vehicle, such as uh, police. OK, that's uh, some quick uh, 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 sharing about uh, our project. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Thank you, Tijun. I think um, also you did a great job um, summarizing all the work that I've been doing in China. And good luck, because China is big. And the challenges, as you said, are not only urban, but also a lot rural. So I would, we would love to hear more about that as well. Um, now, please, uh, Andres Ignacio Vecino Ortiz, a health economist from the University of Johns Hopkins, the, the Johns Hopkins International um, Injury Research Unit. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And thank you to the IDB, um, IRAP, and, and ORI for the invitation. Uh, this is a presentation uh, made joined with Dino Paichatze from the George Washington University uh, uh, Milken Institute uh, School of Public Health. And uh, the, uh, I, initially, we wanted to talk about um, the impact of um, uh, Vision Zero on health systems, but then we thought that uh, actually, we should focus on on the impact on the on the on the health sector as a whole and in in the public health field uh, rather than just in the in the health system. So, I think uh, I should add that. the green one. All right. Oh, okay. Yeah. So a lot of people still ask me, people in the health sector, why is that uh, we care about um, uh, road injuries? And and I usually uh, answer them that actually. The, the main priorities that in global health, uh, which are HIV, TB, and malaria, actually have similar uh, death tolls than, than uh, road injuries. Uh, as many people, as, um, as many deaths as uh, TB has, um, uh, road injuries have every year in the world. Uh, road, uh, road traffic injuries kill more people than um, malaria. And soon, in a few years, or maybe in a decade, um, as many people as HIV kills will be killed in the roads every year. So this is why it's a public health issue. Uh, the RTA problem is large, and if you look at these numbers, you see the region of the Americas doing relatively well. Um, but this is an average. This doesn't show the heterogeneity of, of the region. So this includes the U.S. with a, 11, um, a fatality rate of 11 per 100,000 uh, population. Or includes Mexico with 12, but also includes Colombia with 17, and includes Brazil with 20. So uh, these averages uh, hide the heterogeneity that we see in road traffic injuries in the region, and that's what I'm, I'm going to focus uh, later on. So why the, the road traffic injuries are relevant to public health? Uh, we're talking about deaths, and we have talked a lot about deaths in this, in this um, conference, but they are only the tip of the iceberg. Below that, between 20 and 50 million people get injured every year. And this includes acute care, long-term care because of disabilities, costs related to medications, uh, to uh, devices, uh, people who are injured and ne never treated, and also um, uh, the emotional and psychological consequences of, of, of injuries. So uh, the, the, the toll is huge, and it's very difficult to, to quantify it. Um, also, here you have to take into account uh, other uh, productivity losses that are not only for the health sector, but for the entire economy uh, as a whole. But we also care about this because at the core of public health, uh, we have as a, a main objective to achieve a health for all and a, the equitable access to health. 
And uh, road injuries are, up, are an excellent example of why multi-sectoral issues um, in, in health, like, uh, like this one, actually uh, burden some more than others. And that is why it's so important for public health practitioners to uh, care about uh, road injuries. So, because I, I was going to talk about impact and public health, I will make those points separately. First, let's talk about impact. So we know what works when we look at uh, effective interventions, specific interventions. We, we know which ones of them work and which ones don't. When we look at vision zero as a whole, um, we don't find as much evidence, but there is evidence that it works, which is great. Definitely we need a greater body of evidence and it will uh, take place as long as other as countries and cities uh, adopt the strategy uh, over time. But here are a couple of examples that I really like. One, uh, this one is a study uh, in the four, four first states that adopted Vision Zero in the US. Uh, you will see in the, um, let's see, this is, you will see uh, in the uh, black lines uh, the before and the red lines the after. So these four states show what, what actually happens with Vision Zero. So Idaho had a huge effect, huge drop of, of deaths. Uh, also Minnesota, but not as much in Utah and Washington. And, and the, the issue is there. Um, May, probably because they started at different baselines, but also um, because the implementation is different. So that's the first thing that we care a uh, uh, lot in public health. What is the implementation? What are the actual factors in the field that lead to some, in, uh, some um, vision zero strategies to be very successful, some others uh, less? This is another study. Uh, it's not vision zero itself. It's the fact that actually um, and uh, it, this is, the, uh, this is uh, close to a, a, a recent uh, presentation. Um, the effect that um, uh, joining the EU had for countries in the current EU in terms of road safety. So what they find is actually that joining the EU, which has a more or less uh, vision zero, has a vision zero, zero approach, uh, and they adopted that after joining, uh, reduce mortality rates uh, or fatality rates, but uh, 0.3 uh, deaths per 100,000 uh, individuals. So, so you, we, we see an effect. We know uh, vision zero works. We know isolated interventions work. Uh, we care about implementation, and we think that the, the implementation actually explains the huge heterogeneity we see in the field. Global benefits, we, uh, this is a recent study from our partners at the World Bank. Um, over 24, uh, 24 years, if the achievements in halving road fatalities are, are actually achieved, uh, we, will, um, we would expect uh, increases in GNP uh, between 15 and 22 uh, percent, in, in increases in growth in between 15 and 22 percent. So we know it works and also that we will get um, uh, benefits from, economic benefits from, from uh, this. But again, I want to bring up the issue of equity. And uh, uh, of course, as an average, again, uh, Vision Zero works, but the question is, it's working for whom? And who's bearing the cost? And who's actually benefit, benefiting the most? This is a graph on uh, traffic deaths in the US. The US has experienced a very slight improvement, but it's still, um, it's, it's still uh, high and has not changed a lot. But the huge change has been in this gap. Oh, sorry. Has been in this gap. In the education gap between college graduates, which, uh, which actual rates have been reduced, and less than high school uh, people with less than high school, which actual rates increased. So may, maybe it was actually uh, economic improvements that have maintained uh, the trend in the US, the current trend in the US, but maybe not, because a lot of these actually might not be employed. So, so the huge gaps that we are seeing in, in the socioeconomic um, uh, dimension and road safety are it's something that really um, is concerning for us. This is another example, this is in Brazil. 
uh, for those of you who are familiar with the Brazilian context, in general in the northeast um, uh, region, you have less wealthy states than in the south. And in this case, you'll see that most of uh, uh, vulnerable uh, users' death uh, are actually in that region. So the most vulnerable users in the poorest regions are actually those who um, get killed. In this case, this is also from Brazil, uh, because these were, these were actual final outcomes, deaths. But these ones are intermediate outcomes. So um, you see here LTS ratios, uh, the characteristics of the infrastructure in two cities of Brazil, Curitiba and Rio de Janeiro. And you see how uh, in the wealthiest neighborhoods, you see better infrastructure, uh, friendlier infrastructure, that in the poorest neighbors. Similarly, happens in Curitiba. So um, this highlights the equity issue. And we don't see this in our projects. Of course, when we conduct our own projects, we go and we do this in all the neighborhoods. Um, and we try to implement these activities uh, uh, in an equal way. But when uh, governments take over, it's a different story. And the prioritization process is different. And then it is when we start to see uh, these differences. So final points, road injuries are an epidemic and a public health issue of the same uh, magnitude than tuberculosis, uh, more than malaria, and soon equally to, to HIV. Implementation is key. And that's uh, one of the main focuses we're, we're trying to uh, think about in public health. Vision Zero has shown impact on health outcomes. Uh, and therefore, we expect likely um, a, a, a impacts on the economic burden. But Vision Zero has an immense distributional potential that we need to take advantage of and, of course, measure it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry. There's, there's always like things. If things can happen, things will happen. Um, and that's why we, we, we like working on prevention. I think right now with, with um, Andres' presentation, we just seen what we started discussing from the beginning, right? Like the most vulnerable people, the people that have the less are the ones suffering the costs. And that represents also a bigger cost uh, on the health um, system and other systems as we're going to see. So now I'm going to... Um, uh, give the, the stage again to IREP's CEO, Rob. <laughs> this is all yours. Great. Thanks, Maricela. Um, and look, what I hope I'll present here will answer some of Bella's um, questions before. Uh, because everybody sits there within their own bubble and says, I don't have the resources. And we hear that wherever we go. And our estimate is road crashes cost 100 units. And our current investment at the moment to solve the problem is about one unit. So if you had a problem in your house that was costing you $100 every year, would you be willing to spend $1 to fix it? The answer is yes. But in road safety, we've got these $100 of costs and only $1 of response. So something is broken in how we are financing road safety, how we are resourcing road safety, and what I'm going to talk about now will hopefully be part of the solution to solve that problem. Again, you come back to this injury burden and it's a great connection with the work that you've just presented. Picture your biggest football stadium that you have in your country. Fill it full of people. That's how many are getting injured every day around the world, 100,000 people. The entire populations of Brazil, Mexico, Chile, Venezuela, Peru, uh, all together, Argentina, that entire population is what will be injured between now and 2030. It is a huge burden on every country on this earth and a huge burden in yours. But it doesn't have to be that way if we finally understand the costs of road trauma. And what does that need? It needs one of these spotlights. We have to shine the spotlight down on this scale of injury. At the moment, it's invisible. We talk about serious injuries in just a big bubble. 
It hasn't been personalised yet. And we don't understand the types of injury and the actual crashes that are causing the different injury types. And then importantly, who is really paying the costs associated with treating those injuries? But if we can get the spotlight onto all of that, then we can have the secret to scale. And the work with the FIA Foundation on investing to save lives is helping us explore that, and we're now taking it a step further. And we're doing that. This is work in progress. This is happening with the TAC, the Transport Accident Commission, which is a government-owned monopoly insurer in the state of Victoria in Australia. Every crash that happens in that state and every cost that comes from those crashes in the state is managed by that one organisation. The emergency care costs, the trauma costs, the physiotherapy costs, the welfare costs, the housing costs are all managed by that one organisation. So what does that let us do? That lets us understand crashes like we never have before. So we're putting all of their data into an injury dashboard. And here it is as, a, as an example for you to have a look at. So what do we have there? 77,000 claims. That's how many individuals have been injured. The lifetime costs are over 4 billion. And the big costs, severe brain injury, 27% of the total costs coming out of road crashes in Victoria are severe brain injury. Brain injury is second largest. Limb fractures are next. Internal injuries, the one after. Quadriplegia and the lifetime costs of quadriplegia next. Fatalities after that. Then we get into soft tissue, fractures others, paraplegia, other spinal, etc. That's the real injury burden. That's the individual injuries that are leading to the costs in the system. But then we move across to understand what are the, the crashes that are causing those. So when we look at those on the other side of the chart, vehicles running off the road are accountable for 28% of the claim costs in that entire insurance system. Motorcycle crashes, 21%. And pedestrian crashes, 13%. We're now able to actually point to the individual crash types that are causing these injuries, that are causing these large costs on the health system. But what's the other question that the health system will want to know? They will want to know where in the health system are those costs actually falling? So we're able to map that out for every crash type and every injury type. So we can paint the picture of, which I think is astounding, more than 50% of the crash costs are happening more than two years after the crash. Buried deep in a health system, in a welfare system, a long-term burden on an economy. 12% of those costs are in hospital, 11% paramedical, income replacement 5%, and then we move into some of those smaller things, including ambulance. What we're able to do in that dashboard is actually filter it by any of the individual crash types we would like. So, for example, um, we can map out exactly where and when those crash types will fall in the system. As I mentioned, more than, more than half of the costs are happening two years after the crash has happened. And then when we zoom into an individual crash type, as I mentioned, 28% of the claim costs are coming from vehicles running off the road. When we look at what happens with them, we can see severe brain injuries, 35% of the lifetime costs from runoff road crashes. Brain injury next, quadriplegia 12%, internal injuries 8%. Males overrepresented compared to females. And 70% of the claims in the north to 39 age group. Suddenly, we're actually starting to really understand where the burden of runoff road crashes are. Now, whether you're working in the behavioural area, vehicle area or infrastructure area, can we solve vehicle runoff road crashes? Absolutely. We've got all the solutions, we just haven't understood where all the costs are coming from in the health system to be able to give the resources needed to actually make the difference. And so we're now mapping this across the whole state of Victoria. So we have 22,000 kilometres of star ratings 
right across the state of Victoria. We've got this great database and we're able to overlay all of the claims data over the top of it. We can understand how many brain injuries happen on one star roads versus five star roads. We can understand where in the health system the benefits would come from if we could reduce those runoff road crashes by 80%, by 90%. We can put the business case in front of the health professionals and the insurance industry and start to say, look, let's halve the problem. Let's get the problem reduced by 80%. And then we've zoomed in on the sections of those roads and said, okay, like in this example, 40% of their high volume roads are running at four star or better. If we were to invest in those high return investments, we could lift essentially 78% of travel of length up to that four star or better standard. And that's easy stuff. Like we've got the solutions. This isn't about coming up with new solutions other than a new solution to how we finance this. Because it's just doing these sort of treatments. The Sweden two plus one, but multiplied on a big scale across that whole network. Proven treatments, there they all are. But rather than just talking about we're reducing deaths and serious injuries, let's get down to what we're really doing. We're actually going to save 40 fatalities. That's where this story used to stop. But we're actually going to save 53 brain injuries. We're going to save 127 fractures. Remember, these aren't the broken arms in, in a sporting incident or a, or a little bit of a soccer accident with your knee. These are where your <laughs> limbs, yeah, <laughs> limbs are broken into 12 pieces and need to be completely restitched together. Internal injuries, 53. Three, quad, pe three people will be saved from quadriplegia. We'll save 153 soft tissue injuries and all up 669 people spared the tragedy of being in a hospital or dead as a result of a runoff road crash. And we can map where the savings actually are going to fall. We can paint where in the health system every one of those costs are going to come from. I'm going into the health minister tomorrow and having a discussion about let's share the benefits and fund the solutions. And I'm going to talk to the insurers as well. Say, so what part will you play in halving the insurance burden that you're carrying? And if we can do that, then we can multiply this right across the world. My dream is that we could have a Footpaths for Africa development impact bond. Small diversion of the health aid inflow put into dividend streams for public-private partnerships for a Footpaths for Africa development impact bond. Four star or better transformations like that one in Victoria and ribbon cut every one of them. Wheel out the minister and the health minister and the transport minister. Make everyone celebrate that success. And get our pension funds working. If we can get 8% guaranteed returns in our pension funds through impact investment that's going to save lives, reduce trauma, reduce cost to the health system in a viable public-private partnership, suddenly we have the win-win-win for road safety that will truly save lives. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Now that you look at me when you were talking about knee injury, this was not a road traffic injury, just in case people are asking. Um, this was a sport injury, which could have been prevented as well, but I, I had to stop that goal from happening. Um, so going to our last panelist, Please, if you can join me, Miquel Nadal, the secretary of the high-level panel of FIA. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Maricela. Uh, I want to start with a, with a big thank you to all of you. As Maricela was saying, I'm the last panelist out of 50. I really appreciate the fact that you resisted till the end and, and stayed for this uh, session also. Uh, I'm going to tell you very quickly about uh, a very new and young initiative that we've been launching together with the IDB, and I want to start also thanking the IDB for, for the joint uh, work. Uh, it's an initiative that it's starting to, to deliver results, uh, but what makes it really interesting in my, in my view is that it can be scaled up quite easily, and I think <clears throat> this is one of the main, uh, uh, as I said, interesting uh, outcomes of what we are doing. This initiative, it's called uh, 
movernos seguros means moving safely. Seguros in Spanish is called an adverb, but it means safely, but it also means insurance. So we're playing here with, uh, <coughs> with the words. And it's, a, it's an initiative where the IDB and the FIA, we want to work together with the insurance industry to have an impact on the road safety problem that uh, exists in, in Latin America. Uh, we have seen in, in the previous uh, presentation uh, how large the problem is in, in, in the region, the distributional consequences that it has, and I think this is a really uh, interesting uh, point. So uh, we are trying to have an impact on, on a problem that is uh, extremely uh, important. Uh, the good news uh, for the region uh, and in general, I think, is that we are facing a, a public health problem that uh, in contrast to uh, malaria or to, or to tuberculosis, for example, has around it very powerful industries, very powerful uh, sectors that not only have a responsibility in trying to reduce uh, car crashes in this, in this uh, case. I was attending uh, some weeks ago a meeting and the CEO of Michelin, the big, uh, tire, uh, the big French tire company, said that the industry had a moral obligation to help reduce road crashes. Not only is there this uh, moral obligation, but also there is an interest from the industry, a uh, selfish interest, if you want, from the industry to really try to reduce crashes. And this is the approach that we are, uh, that we are taking. We want to work with the industry from a market-based approach. We want to see how the development of insurance markets in Latin America can have a positive impact on road safety. We are not working with the industry from, from a corporate social responsibility approach, but from a market-based uh, approach. And I think this is what makes the, the project uh, interesting uh, <clears throat> also. So what is the, this relationship between uh, the insurance sector or the, or the insurance industry and uh, road safety? Well, uh, put in very simple terms, we see three, three channels through which this relationship takes place. First, there is compensation. The existence of third-party liability insurance, often compulsory, gives compensation to the victims. This is important. Second, and probably this is <coughs> the most important channel of relationship between insurance and road safety, the design of insurance products can promote responsible driving, can have an influence on the way that people drive. This can be done through the so-called bonus malus, bonus malus schemes or other, or, or, or other elements that you can incorporate into the design of the insurance premiums. And, third, uh, and there is a third channel that is a bit uh, miscellaneous that includes first sharing data. Insurance companies have huge data, as Rob was, was saying, and this um, is very interesting in terms of, of policy or in terms, for example, of raising uh, uh, funding. Second, insurance industry play a leading role in terms of raising awareness through uh, campaigns and so on. And third, and this is also interesting, in some countries, levies on insurance premiums can be used to finance, for example, road safety agencies. This happens in, in, in Colombia, this happens in Argentina, in France also there is a premium that uh, finances, in this case, uh, <coughs> road safety campaigns. Okay, so these are the three, the three, uh, the three channels through which uh, insurance industry and uh, road safety uh, interact. And we think that through this market-based approach, we can, we, we can uh, somehow have a win-win situation. Everyone in the end, both society, governments, and the industry is interested in reducing crashes, in reducing fatalities, because this in the end will reduce claims, and this is good for the, for the industry. So what is it that the, that the, that the that uh, this initiative, Moderno Seguros, tries, tries to do. Uh, basically, <coughs> we try three things. We want Moderno Seguros to be a platform to bring to the same table all the stakeholders that have something to say in this development of insurance markets to have an impact on road safety. So we want to bring together governments, we want to bring together the insurance industry, we want to bring together victims associations, we want to bring together uh, automobile clubs, we want to bring together all those relevant, relevant stakeholders that have something to say in this very important question. Basically, the approach here is that we believe that there is some kind of coordination failure. 
that impedes the different stakeholders that have common interest to interact. And the sole fact of bringing them to the same table can have a positive impact. Not only do we want to bring them to the same table, but we want to explore potential ways of collaboration among them. We want to see if we can develop joint projects. And finally, also we want Movernos Seguros to be a platform to raise awareness on the, uh, on the road safety challenge in, in the region. Uh, <clears throat> Oops. Now, what is it that, that we have done? Well, the project started in, 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 in 2017. There were several contacts, uh, previous contacts with, uh, with, uh, <clears throat> with the companies, with the insurance companies and, and with some governments. And uh, we had a first workshop precisely in this room. This picture was taken in, in this room in October 2017 with participation of President Moreno, of Jean Todt, President of the FIA, and many other relevant stakeholders. And that really served to get the project uh, kicking. In 2018, we had a second workshop last month of July in Montevideo, where we presented the results of a first uh, report that we commissioned to an, uh, to an outside consultant. And this report is very simple and gives a very basic picture of the situation of uh, insurance markets and of road safety in the regions. Let me go very briefly about the results of this, of this report. Well, first, what the report uh, shows is that the car fleet in the region has been increasing very quickly in the last, in the last years. In the case of cars, around 7% per year. In the case of motorcycles, around 10% per year. And this means that the share of motorcycles on the total fleet is very important. We're talking about that motorcycles represent around 25% of the fleet in the region on average, but in some countries, like Colombia, for example, it can go up to 55% of the fleet, which is really a very <coughs> impressive <coughs> participation. Uh, second, the number of victims and uh, of fatalities in the region has remained stable, more or less stable, over the last years, around uh, 100,000, but we see that in the last two years that, uh, for which we got data, 2016 and 2017, there is an increase in the number of, of fatalities. And again, if you look at the, at the right-hand side of the picture, what you see is that, that the share of fatalities coming from motorcycle is increasing very, at, uh, very quickly in some countries, representing in some cases up to 60% of the fatalities in the country. Motorcycles are a very specific problem in the region compared, for example, to, uh, to North America or to Europe, <clears throat> not so much probably to, to Asia. And this is uh, really a challenge from a road safety point of view and from an insurance point of view, because it's not that easy to insure uh, motorcycles. No? Uh, the third, uh, the third uh, outcome that, uh, that comes out of the, of, the, of the report, it gives, well, uh, some figures on the magnitude of the, of the, of the, <coughs> of the um, insurance uh, market. I want to stress here that uh, mm, voluntary premiums are much low, represent a much lower share than voluntary premiums. So this means that the market is based basically on, 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 on voluntary premiums. <clears throat> we could develop that a little bit more, but uh, we, we don't have time. And another interesting uh, uh, thing that, uh, yes, yes, that the report shows is that, uh, <clears throat> well, first, there, there are still uh, six or seven countries where third-party liability insurance is not compulsory. You see Paraguay and you see many Central American countries that do not have a compulsory scheme of, uh, of third-party liability insurance. This is extremely uh, important and it's something that we want to work on. And on the right-hand side, uh, you see the map where <coughs> you can see the, uh, the case where in some countries uh, the, the premiums are regulated and in some other countries, the premiums are free. The fact that the premiums are regulated in practice means that bad, uh, bad, uh, sorry, uh, good drivers subsidize bad, bad drivers. Um, <clears throat> another, uh, another result, uh, interesting result of the, of, the, of, the, of the report is that uh, the, <coughs> the percentage of cars covered through uh, compulsory uh, insurance schemes uh, is in general quite low. We're talking that on average in the region, only 70% of the cars are covered through the compulsory uh, third-party liability insurance uh, premium. And in some cases, it's even lower. And if we would divide this into cars and motorcycles, we would see that in the case of motorcycles, the amount of motorcycles covered through uh, compulsory insurance is extremely low. 
very quickly, <clears throat> well, there are some additional qualitative findings that I won't go into them. What, what have we done with this, with this report? We have clustered the countries in three different groups that you see here. And interestingly, the IDB now is developing pilot projects in one country of each of these groups. Uh, <clears throat> these are the countries that belong to the three different groups. And we are starting to develop pilot projects in Paraguay, <clears throat> in uh, Dominican Republic, and in Bolivia to see how the development, through the development of insurance markets, and to see how addressing some of the problems that these markets have in these countries can help us improve the road safety situation <clears throat> in each of, in each of, of them. Uh, these pilot projects have started already. I won't go into, in the, into them. The most promising one is the one in Paraguay, where the parliament is already working on trying to approve uh, a compulsory scheme for, in, for car insurance in, 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 in the country. Interestingly, and this is the last point I want to make, uh, the industry, I think, has really awakened. Uh, the industry has been reacting to the, to the project, and I think positively. For the first time, the industry, the insurance industry in the region that is grouped under a federation, a, region, a regional federation, has decided to create a, a, road, safety, a, a road safety commission and they will become a part of the steering committee of, of, of Moderno Seguros. So I think this is a very interesting development. And we are exploring with the, the, with the industry ways of collaboration with the FIA clubs to develop different uh, activities. <clears throat> I end up where I started. <clears throat> I think this is a project that, as I said, it's starting to, to deliver, that uh, we want to scale it up regionally, and that hopefully we will be able to also um, uh, try to implement in other regions in the world, notably in Southeast Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you, again. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mikhail. Um, so I think we're, we're starting to look at those, um, those aspects where these topics are linking, right? Rob was telling us all the data he's getting from the insurance and, and how that can be, can be supported in order to talk to Ministry of Health and Ministry of other authorities. However, we see that in Latin America and the Caribbean, we're a bit behind that because we don't even have compulsory insurance. So although some of the vehicles that have insurance can importantly give us uh, some important data, as I was mentioning before with, in the case of AXA Mexico that have been sharing all that information and how we can use it, we need to Again, think of what's the reality in our countries and then go from step one. Well, obviously using what we have. So now I'm going to introduce our, our panelists for the discussion. We're gonna have uh, Nestor Ro, our Transport Division Chief from the IDB. Uh, Sam's job from the Global Road Safety Facility, uh, sorry, Road Safety Lead and Head of the Globe Road Safety Facility from the World Bank. Uh, Eugenia Rodriguez from the Regional, Regional Advisor uh, for PAHO and uh, Natalie Drazen, that you already met her from the previous um, uh, session of the FIA Foundation. So I have a couple of questions first for, for our discussion, and we did it on purpose to have other visions on, on what we have discussed. Um, so I'm gonna make three big questions, and I would like our, first, uh, our four commenters to, to share some of their uh, insights on this. We've heard about these costs and impacts on the health system and the potential of reducing these costs uh, through collaborating with insurance industry, for example. So how could this be scaled up to a point that matters towards reaching the road safety goals and the, and the Vision Zero goal? Um, funding is crucial. The second question would be funding is crucial for governments and organizations to carry out studies and to carry out their interventions and improving the road safety in their communities. However, resources are limited, as we all know. Uh, what are some of the innovative investment mechanisms that you could share with the audience and you can share with the public who is actually struggling with this kind of, of, of challenges? And last question would be, countries' representatives who are out there, and I have later on some uh, online questions for the whole panel, um, are struggling with, are, are asking themselves, how can they be participating on these joint initiatives? And as it's mentioned yesterday, LeapFrog 
uh, from, from those advanced countries and those experiences from the developed countries that have been doing great uh, work as we've heard uh, during these last two years. So what would be your top three recommendations um, to do so? Please, Nestor. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Maricela. Thank you very much. I think, I think many of the answers, this is a very easy panel because most of the answers were already stated in, the, in, in this panel and in the prior, in the prior panels. And, and going to the first question, how do we scale up? And I think it depends on, each, on where we are seeing the problem from. In our case, an in international organization, what, what I see is several processes that we are starting to understand. No, we, have the, we have the insurance companies process, which has a lot to do, not only in the attention of the victims that will actually prevent the death and materialize the vision zero concept, but also prevent and act a lot on the prevention part. Then you have the, the, the health facilities and, the, and their, uh, for example, their communication systems. I think we need to do more in that part to understand uh, what is going there, what is going on in that particular process and so on and so on. We saw something in the infrastructure part and from what Rob was mentioning, and we are starting to put together different pieces of the processes, and that's creating a lot of um, new information. But to scale it up, we need to bring together the people, the organizations, the, the, the stakeholders in charge of, all, of those processes that have some sort of influence in that process. Probably the first, and it was also mentioned here, the first step forward is to share data. There is a lot of data that is coming from those, from those different processes that, is, that it could be put to a better use if we, if we see it from an integration, from the integrative, more integrated uh, uh, point of view. And, and in the case of the regional and international uh, organizations as ourselves, basically I think our job is to try to put, help get these, these uh, stakeholders together, help to find ways to um, characterize these processes in a way that is understandable by decision makers, and I think that's a, that's a, big, that's a big role. Uh, funding is crucial. Uh, it's usually the, the, what we see here is a lot of, going back to the same concept, a lot of those processes and the stakeholders in charge of those processes, we have the same issue. All of us need money. For some, for some reason. For example, and we have seen several cases here where we can create innovative uh, ways of uh, financing that, we, that were there, but we were not thinking on those before. For example, insurance companies. Uh, insurance companies will get more money if, if they provide or invest more money in prevention of, of uh, road safety and if they put in place the concept around Vision Zero is, is, is a win-win uh, concept like, like uh, Michael was saying, and, and, um, and, and that is a particular case where you are getting money that was already there into the system uh, in a very creative way. I think the part also mentioned in the, in the last presentation in regard to the compulsory uh, insurance, is, is, it sounds pretty obvious, but we, although it's pretty obvious, we still many countries that are not using that potential funding from, from there. And, and then, what, what ideas uh, could, we, could we provide to the, to the countries uh, in particular? Well, I think there are like several stages. Could be very easy or very hard, depending on, 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 the, on the political uh, uh, context that you have. But I think one of the big things to be done is reduce the speed. If, if anything that you can do to reduce the speed in the urban settings in particular, you're going to work toward the goal. That's like an immediate thing that can be done is more a matter of how you do it and how you communicate that to the stakeholders that are going to be affected. If you, if you think on that in regard to a particular road that goes across a commercial area where you have a lot of pedestrian traffic, well, usually that's going to be a big issue or political cost with the, with the uh, drivers that are going through that area. But if you reduce the speed, uh, you could get on board as a, as a, in favor of that type of measure. The, the, commercial establishments that are around the road, and that type of things are, the, the, I, I think, the ones that are long have improved that you can do in urban settings. More difficult mid-term uh, mid solutions, put in place more actions for promoting uh, uh, public transportation that requires more analysis, more time to be done, in some cases more money, but in most cases it's not money, it's more political will. And then 
further down the road and harder to do, but, but actually the, the, last, the main solution is rethink our cities, rethink on how we design in the cities so that mobilization and interaction between pedestrians and vehicles are, are taken care of from the very beginning when we design the road. So, so I think those are the, the, the takes that I will provide at this point. Thank you very much, Mr. Natalie, please. I'd love to answer your question about how to scale up uh, success to achieve the UN targets and especially through funding. So let's talk about investments for a second. If you want to make an investment that follows irrefutable data and has a solid return on investment for the future, what population would you invest in? You'd probably invest in youth, right? And that's where the data actually points us. Again, we know that road traffic crashes are the leading killer of adolescents. We know that hundreds of millions of kids around the world are breathing dirty air. But the thing is, we have the data, but we don't have solid commitment and we don't have solid action to tackle this problem. So there's a disconnect. And it's time that we realized that, as Ferry Smith said earlier, and I like this quote, we'll get there fast alone, but we'll get, there, we'll get further together. Because the truth is, road traffic crashes are not the only area that are totally underfunded uh, and don't have enough action. Mental health is another good example. So most uh, mental health illnesses happen, uh, arise before the age of 25. And that's why you see self-harm being the second killer, the second leading killer of adolescent girls. There's another area that's also underfunded even though we have the data. This area is sexual and reproductive health. In developing countries, 19% of girls under 18 are pregnant. And that's why you see that maternal mortality is the first leading cause of death for older adolescents. So the UN recognizes that there are areas that are underfunded. It's not just us. It goes far beyond us, too. But it's time that we join with these areas. And it's time that non-traditional and neglected public health issues, like road traffic injury, follow in the footsteps of traditional diseases that are getting the action and are getting the funding. And it's time that we secure a position at the center of the political agenda to get the political commitment, the resources, um, the action, and also the visibility that, that we need to solve this preventable epidemic. So that's why we are calling for the first ever UN summit on adolescent health. Um, it's been endorsed by the leaders of UN Habitat, of Save the Children. It's been endorsed by governments and mayors around the world, and I hope that you will also join us today in endorsing it at mystreet.org. Um, these, these entities are coming together to endorse this because they realize that investing in adolescents actually has triple benefits. You're helping adolescents now, you're helping adults for the future, and you're also helping the future generation, of course. So again, mystreet.org. Uh, one thing I look forward to next year is bringing UN ambassadors together to put forth a resolution for this summit to make it happen. And I hope that all of you will be on board too. The summit, of course, will feed in to calling for uh, more demand to this issue and also to the ministerial that we'll get to later. And I think we need to recognize the ministerial in Sweden in February 2020 as an opportunity to beat the drum and tell uh, governments around the world that we will not negotiate around the fact that this issue deserves attention and deserves resources. We have to demand those things, and we have to do it by connecting to broader issues and connecting to the wider SDG agenda. Thank you, Natalia. And it's, it's great that you mentioned the, the next uh, global ministerial uh, meeting that would, will happen. We, we, that's going to be the cherry on the cake in some minutes, and we're going to have some, some more information on that. Soms, please. Thank you. Um, in relation to those questions, let me make a few comments on, on two of them. First, on the funding issue, I think that what we need to do about inventive funding is partly inventive messages. And I think that what Rob's presented today on the detail of where we can prove this is happening is really an, an inventive way forward. My, my experience of talking to treasurers and ministers of finance in, in quite a few of our client countries is that their view is 
It's not dismissive in a naive, none of this matters way. It, it is that they sincerely believe that other priorities, even within transport, matter more. And so when we say, well, you know, road crashes are costing, you know, in your country 6% of GDP, 5% of GDP, whatever the number is, the sophisticated answer that sometimes comes back is, well, yes, but lots of those costs are actually part of my GDP. If I'm paying ambulance drivers, if I'm paying hospitals, if I'm paying doctors to see to this, those costs actually add to my GDP. So there's no use giving me figures about my GDP. It's not a useful number for me. And that's why we at GRSF, using funding from Bloomberg, did a different kind of analysis, just asking a different question. Instead of asking, what percentage of GDP are you paying? We asked the question, if you met the target, if you halve the deaths and serious injuries, what would the impact be on your economic growth? Because for low and middle income countries, that's the fundamental question. Their answer to road safety is very often, well, it's the high income countries that can solve road safety. Let me become a high income country, then I'll start solving road safety. <laughs> so give me faster roads and more of them, not safer roads. And Really, the problem is that we have a correlation there that's being treated as a causation, and probably the, the causal factor is the other way around. If you stop paying the costs of road safety, your income, your, your GDP will increase, and that's what we showed in the study of five countries, that if they not removed but halved deaths and serious injuries, then across those five countries over the next 24 years, their GDP would grow by between 7 and 22%. So for one of those countries, it's almost 1% a year extra economic growth by reducing crash trauma. And, and that, I think, is, is a more inventive way to present the detail and be more persuasive of the value of doing this. Um, in, in terms of what are the top two or three things we do, I, I think... To a certain extent, that inevitably depends on the detail of the country. If 70% of your deaths are uh, pedestrians, you're going to do something different from if they're 70% motorcycles than if they're, like most high-income countries, mostly vehicle occupants. But there are a couple of fundamentals. To me, the most important one, which really does connect very closely to the IRAP star rating, is get speeds down. Every one of those road users is going to fundamentally benefit from reducing speeds. And to do that, we need to start showing countries that actually increasing speeds more and more and more does not give you simple economic benefits. In fact, all of your other costs turn and go up. Your fuel costs become less and more higher because you're less efficient. Your greenhouse gas emissions go higher. And of course, with every increase in speed, you get an increase in costs of crashes. So there are good studies in quite a few countries now that show that on a really good open rural road, the ideal speed isn't 100, 110, 120. The economically ideal speed for the country is more like 70 or 80. So I think we've got to rethink the speed thing. The last thing is, you know, if we're going to leapfrog something, let's leapfrog the kind of travel we're aiming for. Instead of everyone going from, I can afford a motorcycle to I can afford a personal car, let's start driving harder and harder on the mass transit and provide mass transit, make mass transit appealing. Pa increase the costs of other vehicles, increase the costs of parking in the CBD. Um, and don't insist when I'm going to take a lane away from a four lane each way road to put in a bus rapid transit that I've got to provide another lane. No, don't provide the other lane. And that means you've got more incentive for the BRT, for people to use the BRT, because it will be that much faster. So I think if there's a leapfrog, it's actually in the style of usage we have for our roads. If we change, if we leapfrog from that steady development of, I've got to have my own car, that's where I'm going to get everywhere, to I'm going to start using the bus because it's faster and more efficient and better for all of our agenda, I think that's the leapfrog to aim for. Very interesting. Thank you. Eugenia, please. I would like to go back to the first recommendation that we have in 2004 when we launched the World Report on Road Safety, and so the, the recommendation about working in intersector approach. And so when I'm talking about intersector approach, I think it's at regional level, country level, and local level. 
And so I would like to make emphasis in this recommendation to work in the local level in the intersector approach. Uh, since the last 15 years works in this field, I think the best result that I could see is a local level. And so I think at the local level we can have the key actors together and to apply the solution that we are talking about and this, what is the priority. When we talk about um, public transportation, and so I think we can build the capacity in our countries, in our cities, that you can address more people that work in this solution for mobility. When you saw this number that you have, that's, that you mentioned, that some countries, the reality that you have, more than half of that related to road traffic industries relate to motorcycle. I think we should try to find solutions for that. And so it is immediately, and more and more, we are seeing this reality. And so when we talk, we are talking about that, but we talk about also for injuries, disability, cost, how this impact the city budget, and so when we are talking about the funds, and so if we work more at the local level, we can convince mayors to invest in this change and, so, and to make and to promote road safety. And recently, the, we had the results of one of the city in Brazil, in Salvador, for instance, they already accomplished this goal for the decade. They already could reduce the number of deaths uh, in last three years making this intersector approach, working with the data and so to know how the interventions or infrastructure intervention should be and to improve the uh, enforcement of legislation on speed, on drink and drive. And so I would emphasize that if you work at local level and build capacity for this city available to this, I think we will answer the other questions about the fundings and the budget. And so we will have, if you save that money from the health sector, level, we will have more money to, to promote road safety. Great. So I, I, think, I think it's clear, right? We have the evidence, we have the information, we know what to copy and what not to copy. Um, so I don't know if, if I'm getting the same or, or different than what you are getting out of the, in the countries that are here in the room. So it looks like it's more an issue about commitment and will and rather than money or, or knowing what to do. So I'm getting that sense. Before, I'm just going to make one, before opening the floor for one question, because we're running a little bit late. Uh, I have an online question from Jamaica, open for the whole floor, which is, um, is it, it is clear how valuable this data on health system costs can make the economic argument for an investment in road safety. Do you have any strategies or examples or methodologies to measure impact in countries where the welfare system might not be so developed that data on cost of care after the immediate treatment is available because it is more likely picked up by families or, or, or victims rather than insurance or the state. In these cases, it's more difficult to capture the true complete cost of road traffic injuries. Yeah. Look, that's a great question. Uh, so, <laughs> the, where there's some hope, and I, I, hopefully the other speakers will have some input as well, the work that we're doing with the TAC is very much to create the framework for all of these costs. And then we could see it very possible that you could take this framework into Jamaica and uh, talk to the health sector. How much does a brain injury cost you in the health sector? And some of that data might be available. They may not have yet connected it to road trauma, but we'll know the costs of treating brain injury might be available. Um, likewise, when you break down that pie chart of where the costs actually fall, we're doing that at such a micro level that in, let's say again in Jamaica, if we were to calibrate there, our view is that we'd go in there and go, yes, that's a true financial cost in Jamaica. We, we pick that up in our health system this part of the cost is as well. This one isn't. This one's typically left down to be a burden for the family to pick up. And so it goes from being a true financial cost to being a social cost uh, and a opportunity cost for the community. And so we think as we go across from the TAC that has everything in it, that as we move across to other countries, we'll be able to calibrate each part of that system once we've done that, then whether the intervention is safer road users, safer vehicles, or safer roads, that if we can estimate how many of each crash type we can save, we can then still paint out 
an estimate for Jamaica, even if that data is not available. Um, and again, if we're plus or minus 5%, I'll live with that if it leads from, again, we're, we're underfunding by a factor of 100 to 1. If it leads to a tripling of budgets, that's great. If it's a 50 times budget increase, that's great. And that plus or minus error we're talking about ultimately um, should not matter. Um, and just finishing, I think at the development level, Asian Development Bank I'm aware of is, is doing some work to try and understand that true social cost, the, the, the burden that is picked up by families, what happens when the breadwinner is injured and the family pulls out of education and schooling to look after their, their injured father or mother. Um, and so there is some studies I'm aware of and, and again there might be some people here who know about more that we should sort of bring into that total picture if we can. Thank you. Any other comments? Michael, please. Uh, just to insist, I mean, uh, clearly we have a problem with data. I mean, uh, I think it was this morning someone said that uh, if we don't have, the, if, you, if you cannot measure things, you cannot manage them, no? And, and clearly this is a case in point. Uh, in the case of, of, of data from insurers, we're talking about very sophisticated data, but the problem we have with road safety is that even the most basic data, that, like the number of fatalities, we don't know exactly what the number of fatalities is in the world. I mean, according to WHO, is 1.3. According to government reported data, is half, half that amount. So the, the, the discrepancy is huge. I think that investing in observatories, and this is the presentation that Mark Joel uh, made yesterday, is extremely important. I mean, we need to invest in getting good data and in making sure that the existing data is shared, because otherwise it will be very difficult to improve. Sams? I, I really agree. I think that part of our problem is the failure of data, and part of this is about that failure of data. But the problem, is, the problem that's being raised in, in this really important question is actually much broader than this one. So it's, it's not just that in some cases people decide they can look after their relatives at home. In, in many countries, if you go and really ask the right question, then what you find is there are people rushing injured victims of crashes to hospital thinking they've done the right thing, and, and one would think that's, that's reasonable and they have, but actually if you quiz the hospitals carefully enough, what you find is they will assess whether that person can afford to pay, and if they can't, they'll send them home. So they may have arrived, they may be in desperate need of care, but they won't get it. So the extent to which this, these data are lost from the system is much larger than just when the family chooses to. It, in very brutal circumstances, it's where the hospital chooses to refuse because they can't afford to just do this stuff. So it, it is a very large problem, and therefore a very large problem, a fundamental failure in data in terms of deaths, injuries, costs, etc. And it's one of the reasons the, these observatories uh, are a, a really critical development. Thank you. So in, because we're running quite um, late on time, unless there's a burning question from the audience, there's not? Okay. So I think just uh, on the last comment of Psalms, not to finish on a, on a very uh, negative, because it is still sad, and, and, and I completely agree with your comment, Psalms, like, don't get me wrong. I completely agree. However, I, I like to, people that know me knows that I'm very optimistic. And, and what I like to, to finish this idea as well is that I'm extremely honored and extremely happy about this event and that this event happened because this event, as you've seen, has got us all together. And people that sometimes, and, and I even talked to, to Margie yesterday, a lot of people who has been in road safety for a long time know uh, Margie Peden. And I was talking with her and she was telling me, wow, there's a lot of new people here. Like people that haven't really been on road safety um, were involved. So I want to thank you all and uh, for this, it's not over, um, for being here. So I want to I finish with that, this session with that optimistic view that we have here people that work on investment, we have multilateral development banks, we have NGOs, we have people from the high level panel, from, we have everybody here from the health, from urban development. So I think all the pieces and all the, the ingredients of the cake are here. So I think we just need to bake it on the right, on the right temperature in order to have it bump. So for that, I want to give a round of applause for this excellent panel. And please. <laughs>
Thank you very much. And while they, while they go down the stairs, I want to welcome the cherry on this cake uh, for, for, the, for the next um, great event that we're going to have soon in Sweden. And meanwhile, we're, while we get the stage uh, clear, I want to welcome uh, Matt Saki Bellin, the senior advisor from, uh, I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce it. How, do, how should I pronounce it in Sweden? S Swedish Transport Administration. Yeah, yeah, but in <laughs> Swedish, in Swedish, of course. But in Swedish, how would I pronounce it in Swedish? Trafikverket. Traffic Yeah. Okay, there you go. So uh, please, the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, it's been uh, lots of discussion these two days about Vision Zero, but parallel actually with this whole movement with Vision Zero, it's been a, another kind of movement. And that movement is to make road safety on the top on the uh, global agenda, the international agenda. And actually everything started in 2004 because 2004 was the first time ever in the history that the UN General Assembly discussed road traffic injuries. And uh, Dabejo, together with World Bank, they developed this first, also the first one uh, ever in the history, the World Report on Road Traffic Injuries. And this has been a kind of formative moment, moment and uh, now we can see how we step by step now slowly uh, make road traffic injuries to become a very important uh, topic when it comes to, to the interna international agenda. The next step in this uh, process was when in 2009, when also the first time ever in the history when the Russia organized the first ministerial conference in Moscow 2009. And one of the outcome from that conference was the decade of action, which also was adopted by the UN General Assembly in 2010, the global plan for road, uh, road traffic. And the second conference was a kind of midterm conference in Brazil in 2015. And uh, during that conference, we discussed uh, the progress when it comes to, to this decade of action. But also, uh, parallel with that, uh, the road traffic injuries have become a part of these sustainable development goals. And now, uh, in 2020, Sweden will uh, organize the third ministerial conference. Uh, it, it is my organization, the Swedish Transform Administration, we are responsible for the conference and we work in close collaboration, of course, with the Swedish government and, and with the World Health Organization. And we would like to see a very inclusive approach when it comes to this conference with, with the ambition to include all important stakeholders. It will take place in the 19, 20, February 2020. It's not the best time during the year to come to Sweden in February. Uh, I wish we could have put it instead in June, but uh, the reason why we would like to put it there is because in April 2020, it will probably be a discussion about road safety in the UN General Assembly again, and we would like to make sure that if we come up with something important during this conference, that that will also be able to get into the UN General Assembly, of course. And we will be in a very nice, um, uh, venue, the Waterfront Conference Center, and it's in it's, the uh, middle of central Stockholm. It's just be behind the, the train station. And we think that we approximately will have 1,500 1, uh, participants. And uh, if you have questions, uh, you can always uh, use this email address now, then you will reach the, the, uh, the organizer of this conference. So when we have started to talk about this conference, uh, we think that there are some aspects now that we really need to bring in in this conference. And of course, 
one thing will be to reflect now over this decade of action and the progress that has been achieved during this 10 years period. That will be a very important part of this conference. But we will also discuss the next step. Uh, and probably we have to uh, discuss a new objective for a new target for 2030, because as you probably know, uh, the 3.6 targets is only for uh, is 2020. So we have to discuss now the next uh, target for 2030. But we also need to discuss uh, what kind of strategy, what kind of effect effective strategy do we think we will need to uh, um, support for the, for the next decade. And um, if you go back, let's say, 15 years ago, I don't think I could say this then, because Vision Zero was um, a kind of obscure thing from the North countries, Scandinavian countries, and we thought that maybe this is something only for uh, the Scandinavian part of the, the, the world. But as you can see now during these two, year, two, two days, uh, that's not the case anymore. This Vision Zero is spreading around the world. Uh, even to middle-income con countries, actually. So, so that's really something on the agenda now. And of course, we would like to make sure when we organize an, uh, a conference that we take some of these basic principles and, and the systematic approach which underpins this Vision Zero and, and uh, also put it uh, into the agenda for, for this conference. We also know that there are huge differences between different countries and regions around the world. Uh, some countries have 25 fatalities per 100,000 inhabitants. Sweden, we have less than three fatalities per 100,000 inhabitants. So the, the re, there are huge differences between different countries, and we, we need to accommodate for that in a, in a conference like this. We also would like to promote a very multi-sectoral approach when it comes to road safety. Even if the government and the politicians is very important and the member states when it comes to road safety, there are also a lot of other stakeholders that needs to be involved to make sure that we achieve our, our targets for 2030. Uh, we also may need to make sure that we really integrate road safety now into the whole kind of uh, 2030 agenda and, and integrate safety into uh, all, all other kind of sustainable aspects. So that will also be an important uh, topic for, for this conference. Uh, this conference will, of course, uh, it's not an open conference that you, you applied and uh, you would like to come. It will be some kind of uh, conference uh, by invitation, but there will be lots of uh, room for different things to happen. So probably we will have a, uh, the most people who are interested, they will be able to, to come to, to this conference, I think, in the, in the end. So I will stop there, and, and I would also would like to thank the organizer of this conference, because this, this has been a fantastic two days, I think. Uh, I learned a lot. Thank you. you could say, okay. okay. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, so for the closing statement, um, I, I, was, I was telling them backstage, this has been taking so long to organize, and it's already almost done, and, and we're almost there, we're almost finished. Uh, so I just want to, to get on stage um, Sergio Avelleda, from the Urban Mobility Director from WRI, Rob McHenry, from the CEO of IREP, I'm sorry, I'm trying my best, and Esteban Dios Rux, from the, trans uh, the, the Transport Principal Specialist from the IDB, for the closing statement, please. <laughs> you can dance if you want. Uh, then, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, 
I would like to thank the Inter-American Development Bank, IREP, and uh, the FIA Foundation, my wonderful team from WRI who worked hard to help to organize this important event. We had two intense days to discuss and to be more prepared to go to the field and to engage more people, more authorities, more organizations in the cause of the Vision Zero. I think it was a very, very interesting event. And after this, we need to be more intense in the field. We just listened from our colleague, Eugenia, the local level, in my opinion, is the key to improve the safety road. We need to use the data that we learned today, how we collect, how manage, how measure to engage more people. Don't forget, good public policy is made with good design, good plan, good implementation, but the essential is good and is strong engagement. Let's do it. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you. And likewise. <laughs> likewise, I'd like to say a big thank you to WRI and to IDB, um, to all of the IRAP team who made such a big difference in getting everything ready for this US RAP and the FIA Foundation as well. Um, it is about all coming together for this, this one problem. And, uh, and Vision Zero and innovation is about us, one, believing it's possible, and two, not letting any barrier get in our way and be innovative about getting around those barriers, whether they're financing, whether they're political will, whether they're about the mechanism of, of funding global road safety, uh, or it is about the tactical treatments that we put in in cities or on motorways or on rural roads right around the world. Um, I'd also like to say a very big thank you to all of our RAP partners from around the world, from Mexico, from China, from Thailand, from India, uh, from Australia, New Zealand, Croatia, all around the world, um, all of those RAP partners uh, are the key to our success. IRAP's a, a very small charity and what we make happen is because of our partnerships with the development banks and the governments and all those NGOs and FIA clubs around the world who help make that happen. And I believe together we can really ramp up that scale. We're organised now, we know what we're doing, we just need innovation in scale and we can make this happen. Thank you, everyone. To finish off, again, the last one. Um, first, obviously, thank you, IRAP. Thank you, WRI. Specifically, I'd like to thank Rob, Judy, Claudia Alejandro from WRI and, and IRAP, and our own staff here at the ADB, Sheila, Paz, Tania, Joao, Ana Maria, and especially Maricela, they've done a great job. It's been an enormous amount of work, so thank you very much. Um, to close, sometimes when we hear all these numbers of road safety, and, and unfortunately, they're always the same numbers, and, and we all know them by heart. It's, it's 1.3 million, uh, 3 to 5% of GDP. It's 130,000 dead in, in, in just in our region in Latin America. And we kind of lose sight, and, and it seems that this problem is also almost insurmountable. I want to finish on a little bit more positive note. In 1990, Spain had 6,000 deaths on their roads. Um, th th their, their fatality rate was comparable to what we see in Latin America right now. 2015, 25 years later, they had 1,200. That's a reduction not of 50% like we have in, in our target for the decade of action. That's a reduction of 80%. And that was accomplished with increments in their motorization rates with many more kilometers driven. It can be done. And 80% is not a small number. So I think that we also have to take the positive message. It, it seems like an impossible task. It is not. If you put the effort, if we work jointly, it can be done. And I think that we really have to look very closely at these examples on, on people who have done it. Thank you very much. And thank you all for participating and the people who are connected by websites or, or abroad or on the internet. Again, thank you very much. Really, thank you. Congratulations. So thank you again and see you next in Sweden. <laughs>